Um, Sharia, can you see my slide? Okay, so we're gonna... So, hello everyone. Nice to see you all here. Today we have a very exciting webinar and uh, we're going to talk about um, PhD, uh, how to do PhD um, abroad. And we have two speakers today who will share their experiences and their journeys of pursuing doctoral studies in Canada. So we have Pakize Uloda, uh, who is a PhD candidate in applied linguistics in the Department of Education at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. And her research interests include um, L2 writing, language assessment, and corpus linguistics. And uh, we have another speaker, Shadia Mansour, who is also pursuing her doctoral studies in online and distributed learning at Athabasca University, Canada. Her research interests are second language acquisition and classroom pedagogy in the online multimodal web conferencing environment, instructional and curriculum design for online language teaching and learning. So please join me to welcome. Um, thank you for accepting our invitation to talk to our audience today. And um, yeah, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it's a great pleasure to be connected with teachers and researchers from Uzbekistan and from, um, from other places. I, I heard there are people joining from Pakistan and uh, other countries. And thank you, Nodira, for giving us this opportunity. Um, so Nodira has already introduced us. Uh, let, me, uh, let me repeat it. My name is uh, Paki Zaluda, and uh, I'm a third year PhD candidate in applied linguistics. Uh, at Concordia University's Education Department. Um, so I am currently based in Montreal, Quebec, and I am holding a student permit as a, a temporary resident. And my friend Shadia Mansour, she is a, a second year EDD student at Athabasca University, where she is uh, studying distance education, online and distributed learning. Um, so she lives in Toronto as a permanent resident and today what we are hoping to share with you is our experiences as graduate students in Canada. Uh, we will present two distinct perspectives um, because our programs, the nature of our studies and our approach to research are different uh, and we would be happy to answer your questions so please feel free to use the chat box and uh, we'll get back to your questions in the end. Uh, if you wanna ask your question on the spot, that's totally fine. Okay, so um, I guess I can start with giving you a quick overview of my academic background before uh, moving to PhD. Uh, so I received my master's degree in TASEL from Northern Arizona University in 2011. And um, to translate my theoretical uh, knowledge into practice, I accepted a lecture position at Qatar University. Uh, that's where Shadia and I worked together uh, for five years. Uh, and I primarily taught um, academic writing courses to Arabic learners of English. Uh, and during that time, I developed an interest in language assessment um, as I recognize a gap between writing curriculum design and assessment practices. Um, my interest and passion in second language writing and test evaluation motivated me to pursue a PhD in applied linguistics so that I could further study writing assessment. Um, the reason why I wanted to really study at Concordia University it was that um, I wanted to work with my supervisor. So I picked my supervisor, Professor McDonough first. So having her as my research director was one of the driving forces behind my decision. Also, um, my research focuses on the assessment of second language writers. So I was particularly excited about studying my PhD in Quebec where English is uh, spoken as a second language by many residents. Um, I will get back to the language dynamics in Quebec, but uh, let me tell you about like why Canada is such an attractive location for, uh, for international students in general and particularly for PhD students. All right, here we go. Um, 
so first of all, uh, Canada, you know, is consistently ranks as one of the best countries in the world for the quality of life. And uh, some of the international universities and colleges, um, such as uh, University of Toronto and McGill University are located in Canada. And there are more than 100 accredited universities and colleges offering higher education in English and, and French. So it is a bilingual country. Um, so studying here is a great opportunity if you want to practice your English, you know, and learn some French. As a PhD student, you don't always get, get enough time to, to learn French, but at some point, you know, if you continue living here, I guess, that's one of the options. Um, also, uh, there are several um, graduate, well, I would say the tuition fees uh, tuition and fees are much more affordable compared to higher institutions in the US. Uh, also, there are several graduate scholarships to cover the cost of tuition and, and expenses. And along with individual universities and colleges, the Canadian government also offers um, awards for graduate students. Um, and I believe for me, another advantage of pursuing doctoral studies in Canada is that you can obtain a postgraduate work permit and a permanent residency if you're interested in um, staying in Canada after um, graduation. Um, so uh, I guess overall Canadian culture, which embraces diversity, uh, it is multicultural and multilingual environment, and, and especially stable economy during uh, COVID makes Canada home to thousands of international students. Okay, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about my uh, university, which is uh, Concordia University, located in the heart of uh, Montreal. Uh, it is an English medium university, and the campus is located in uh, in downtown, which is an English-speaking uh, neighborhood. Um, within the education department, there are different academic programs, such as applied linguistics, adult education, child studies, educational studies, and, and, and educational technology. Uh, and these programs all for PhD degrees. Uh, in terms of the degree requirements, um, uh, one needs to complete 90 credits for graduation, and 12 credits come from required courses and nine credits from electives. Uh, there is a comprehensive exam that PhD students need to take and um, a thesis proposal and dissertation writing. So overall, you, um, you get like 90, 90 credits uh, before graduating. I would say applied linguistics department uh, a program uh, within the education department at Concordia focuses primarily on research and tr training, which is great if you have strong uh, theoretical background. Um, you know, I personally, I wanted to engage in a lot of research and, and gain some, some more experience in undergraduate level teaching. So, uh, so I, I, I thought that the, the, the program, which is focusing more on research, but less on coursework is very attractive to me. Um, finally, as part of the admission um, package, uh, the university offers a variety of uh, funding for PhD students. And uh, once you start your academic degrees, you can apply for some uh, teaching and research assistantship positions. Well, I believe majority of the students that, well, this is to the best of my knowledge from my colleagues and my uh, um, other PhD students, a lot of students are funded with International Tuition Award of Excellence, which, uh, which significantly lowers uh, the tuition for international students. Uh, if you get some other fundings like graduate fellowships, so that covers uh, the whole tuition and fees for you. So, um, so I think it's quite affordable in that sense compared to United States. Okay, um, so in terms of living in Montreal as an international student, uh, well, as, as, I, as I previously mentioned, and I'm sure most of you already know, uh, French is the official language of Quebec. Uh, so if, if you visit Montreal or if you go there for studying, you will see that, you will see that like um, color of French identity and cultural heritage. So it reflects on, on the architecture, uh, food culture and lifestyle. Uh, especially in certain uh, neighborhoods. 
Um, but I would say the local community is very supportive and they're really nice to international students. So personally, I never experienced any problems living, um, living in Montreal as an English speaking student. Uh, in terms of the cost of living, uh, compared to Toronto, it is much cheaper um, in terms of housing and transportation. Actually, a lot of students prefer to study in Toronto because, you know, it's more multicultural or maybe like it's uh, it's an English speaking uh, province. Ontario is an English speaking province. Shadia will give you a better perspective of that. Um, but uh, I think um, in Montreal, you can, the rent is cheaper, you know, and uh, there are two universities, McGill and Concordia, which are uh, English medium, and both of them offer PhD in education. That could be an option for you if you are interested in, uh, in academic studies. Also, um, one thing that is, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, something that I, I would like to emphasize is the winter in Canada, you know, it is quite harsh sometimes. It lasts, you know, six to seven months. <laughs> and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but yeah, especially in Montreal, it is much cooler than Toronto. And let me show you this photo from Daily Hive. <laughs> this is actually the struggle. Well, the struggle is real, as you can see. We we experience uh, really harsh winters, but you know, as you live, continue living in, in Canada, you develop some strategies to enjoy cold weather, and and you you figure out things that you can actually do when it is really cold outside. So. Um, okay, as for my personal experience as an international student in Canada, uh, I am holding a, a valid study permit and social insurance number. Uh, so that makes me eligible to work on campus as a research and uh, teaching assistant. Um, so also like if you if you have a study permit, you are eligible to work as a part time instructor. Um, there, I have some, some colleagues who work off campus uh, and your study permit actually gives you 20, like give, gives you the, makes you eligible to work 20 hours per week off campus. So that's pretty cool. And finally, one thing that makes Canada really attractive is that if you're moving, moving to Canada with your common law partner, then, um, then they are granted with an open work permit for full-time work in Canada. So I moved, to Montreal with my uh, with my husband, and um, you know he did not need to uh, look for a work visa from uh, from his workplace because he already had this open work permit, which came together with my uh, student permit. Okay. Um, as for my PhD level of research experience, uh, as I previously mentioned, I'm pretty much like interested in second language writing and assessment. Mm -hmm. And to date, uh, my research uh, specifically focused on uh, integrated writing task uh, on Canadian academic uh, English language tests. So this is a standard design proficiency test, very similar to, to TOEFL and IELTS, but this is more, um, this is local base. Uh, also, uh, my supervisor and committee members, like together with them, I conducted some research about L2 writers source integration on classroom based uh, writing assessment situations. Um, so, well, currently I am actually writing my thesis, <laughs> which is non traditional. It's a, it's a manuscript based thesis constructed around three related manuscripts. Uh, so in the first study, I am exploring EAP instructors' perceptions about their current uh, writing practices, writing and assessment practices of integrated writing. Uh, in the second study, I am building on the results of the first study and uh, design, I'm designing and validating an analytic rubric for assessing the construct of integration in EAP student writing. And my third study is examining EAP students' development of source integration skills during a semester long EAP course. Well, I am scheduled to defend my thesis in May, 2021. So it's pretty soon. Uh, so it is, uh, it is quite a challenge <laughs> for me this semester uh, to deal with all these three studies. And also um, while I'm coming to that, I, ha I have been teaching a course at an undergraduate TASL course, which is testing evaluation and court design, course design, um, uh, which is delivered remotely. So as a PhD student, I'm allowed to teach that course because it's considered to be part-time if you're teaching one course. 
also from like during the last three years, I had done a lot of graduate teaching assistantship and, and uh, I worked as a research assistant or project manager and I helped my supervisor and, uh, and some other faculty members designing materials and procedures, managing and training other research assistants. So I, I've been keeping really busy and I would say that uh, in Canada, if you're getting your PhD in Canada, you you will you will get this experience together. You will have this balance between teaching and research. Also, the coursework will help you develop as, as an academic scholar, uh, hopefully. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop here and I will look at your questions. I'm sorry, I've seen a, that people were writing in the chat box. <laughs> here we go. Um, do you, the university offer a fully, oh no, I'm gonna go to the beginning. All right. Um, does the university offer a fully funded scholarship? Uh, in my case, yeah, I, my, my studies uh, are fully funded because I secured two different scholarships. Uh, but if it's not fully funded, I think for PhD students, at least you get to pay uh, the pro like province rate. You know, students from, from Quebec, they pay like maybe 20% of the tuition that the international students pay. And uh, PhD students are usually offered that kind of scholarship. So it is, it is not too bad. Uh, and in my case, I got an extra fellowship so that covered the rest of my tuition, which, uh, which is great. And then um, I also got some teaching assistantship and research assistantship jobs. So that was uh, pretty helpful. Um, how much stipend they gonna pay for PhD? Is it possible to work while studying at PhD? Um, uh, for PhD students, uh, the hourly rate on campus is uh, around 28 Canadian dollars. So on campus you can work, while well, I'm not, I'm, I don't wanna give you wrong information, but I think you can work as much as you want. <laughs> Uh, but when you're getting your PhD, uh, I don't think you will have time to work a lot. So I usually go for 15 to 20 hours of work, uh, except this semester, um, because I'm teaching this semester. Um, but yeah, the stipend it depends on like how many hours you work. But also like in Canada, there is that 30% cut from your uh your salary because we're paying high taxes here. So that doesn't leave too much money <laughs> for, for you as a as stipend, but still you can, you can survive, uh, I believe. Is it possible to, oh yeah, and you can also work off campus if you want to. What's your suggestions improving writing skills? Ooh, <laughs> that's a tough question. <laughs> I think um, personally, I would say, uh, are you asking as a, as a student or as a teacher, um, Sharali? Shir as a student, as a student. As a student, okay. I, well, personally, I believe writing improves getting feedback from, from others, from someone who knows how to write. So my personal strategy when I was a student was was to write multiple drafts and get feedback from, from my instructors. Um, other than that, I think reading really helps uh, when it comes to writing. I believe that there is this like very close connection between reading and writing. So the more you read, the better you write. Um, but, you know, writing is a skill. Which, what is that? Oh. Pakize, could you please unmute yourself? Pakize, could you please unmute yourself? Yeah. Yes, sorry. Okay, so, <laughs> so writing is a, is a longitudinal skill, which is not something you can develop on the spot. So I would suggest like keep writing and, and there's no reason for you not to improve your um, different areas. <laughs> okay, so uh, what else? Um, is it possible to legal, stay legally in Canada after graduation at master's or PhD? Yes, there is, um, there is post-graduation work permit that you apply after graduating from, uh, from a two years uh, degree, which could be master's or PhD. 
and you can legally stay in Canada and look for jobs. And if, if you can find a job, you can, you can look for permanent residency. Um, sisters, are you living in Canada? Yes. <laughs> Currently, I am yeah. I am visiting Turkey, but yeah, I, I live in Canada, Montreal. Yeah. Is IELTS required for admission? Yes, definitely. You need to provide uh, evidence of your proficiency, English proficiency. Before I apply for PhD, do I need to contact with one of the professors from the university? It depends on the university that you're applying for. I would say, personally, I... I knew my supervisor before I went for, for a PhD. And in my statement of purpose, I mentioned her name clearly, like I want to work with this professor. And uh, she knew me beforehand, but but the university website, Concordia University website says that you don't pick your supervisor. We find a supervisor that is suitable for you. So in in case of Concordia University, no, you don't need to get in touch with anyone. You can directly apply if you wanted to. I'm sure Shadia will uh, have a different answer for that. Uh, by the way, Shadia, should I stop and we handle the questions together later on? Because these are very general questions now. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, that would work. Okay. Yes. Sounds good. Why don't you go ahead and, and in the end, yeah. we will get back to the questions. Sure. <laughs> Let me share my screen. You got to stop sharing. If you could, please. Yes. This. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Pakistan, like for. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Insight? Would you like to go to presenter mode, Shadia? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. I'm just gonna move this bar of Zoom. <laughs> no. Nope. Not there, right here. Exactly. So um, thank you very much, Pakiza, for sharing your insights and um, experience as a PhD student in in, in person program um, at Concordia University in Montreal. Um, before I move to share my own experience, I'd just like to say that I'm a third year. Pakiza, time flies by, right? <laughs> third year student and um, uh, still, though, preparing in the phase of preparing for uh, my proposal, I um, will be defending uh, in, uh, in a month, uh, inshallah, hopefully, <laughs> right? Um, uh, my proposal, but our program is one year longer than Pakistan's program. Same credit, but different distribution of courses. Um, yeah, so yes, and just give you a little bit of my background. I am residing, yes, in the, the GTA, the Great Toronto area, but I am also an immigrant. Um, I had earned my bachelor's in academic purposes in Tunisia because I am originally from Tunisia. And then I moved um, more 17 years ago from Tunisia to the United States where I earned my master's I earned a scholarship um, the Fulbright scholarship then I earned another scholarship for my master's then I was teaching as a full-time for... <laughs> you could mute yourself please yes Welcome. sorry thank mm -hmm. you for joining us just mute your microphone thank you yes so um, after my Fulbright uh, scholarship in the United States, that was my very first uh, journey there. I earned another scholarship uh, and I earned my master's in applied linguistics from the Old Dominion University. Then right away, I was teaching at William & Mary, if you know, in Virginia um, uh, for about eight years, full time, different positions, different courses mainly. ESL and uh, AFL, Arabic Seven Foreign Language grants for different research for curriculum design um, and also leadership. Then I met Pakistan, Qatar, moved over there. Then I started my PhD three years ago uh, when I moved to Canada, and that was also planned. And I will talk about planning and scheduling. It's very important and a vision, uh, having a vision as well. So, yes. Um, let me start by sharing um, my experience as an EdD, not a PhD student, uh, attending not an in-person uh, program as Pakiza, but an online doctoral program at Athabasca University. 
And before I introduce Athabasca University, I'd just like to ask this question that I had at the very beginning. What is the difference between a PhD and an EdD? Well, generally speaking, a PhD is for those who are research oriented, more likely like Pakistan mentioned, while EdD um, attracts mostly those who are practitioners, um, uh, who come from, meaning that they come from different backgrounds and they have long years of experience and leadership in their various fields that they come from. However, it really depends on the program and the university. Um, for instance, my program equally uh, include both perspectives and values, research and practice. Um, so I will talk right now about Athabasca University. Where is Athabasca University? Well, it's an open university, meaning it's an online university. Yes, people, uh, students are admitted um, from all over the world, um, whether residing in Canada or not. Um, mm. But at the same time, uh, it has its main campus, which is in Alberta, Alberta, the city of Alberta, uh, of Athabasca in, in, in Alberta as a, a province. And um, there are many different uh, branches of the university across Canada uh, and the various different um, provinces in on, on Ontario and here in Toronto and, and, and in others, other cities and also in BC and Manitoba and across Canada. So, um, and why? Why did I choose Athabasca University in particular? I applied to the University of Toronto, as a matter of fact, and I was on the waiting list and I had to decline when I got um, uh, this uh, admission from Athabasca University for several reasons. The first one is I had this vision of um, I got a little bit bored from teaching, I have to say, <laughs> you know, and the leadership that I was doing. And I do have a very strong passion to apply linguistics, but I started to realize that the whole world is valuing more and more online education in general, and that the language field in terms of learning and teaching is also moving slowly yet forward uh, towards that direction. So my vision is always to keep learning and to do something new and exciting. So I said, okay, this will not really be a completely different thing to do, which is, um, yes, an education uh, in general, but uh, this program has also professors uh, who are applied linguists and linguists. And that's one of the main reasons. As Pakistan mentioned, I knew the professors up front uh, that I would like to, my co-supervisors, I have two of them, one in main co the supervisor and co-supervisor, and I wanted to work with those in particular. So it's moving to a new field, but at the same time, uh, continuing with my other field of applied linguist and linguistics, bringing into the online mode. And um, also, it was recommended from colleagues um, in the United States and um, other parts of the world because it's unique in North America in the sense that there is no other university in the United States or in Canada that offers a doctorate in education um, and for distance, uh, distance education and online and, and distributed learning. And it is worldwide, it is worn as a pioneer in distance education and online learning and teaching because mainly the distance ed scholarship comes from Athabasca University. All those scholars that you read right now that you come across talking about online learning like Anderson and Garrison and Bates and Siemens and Cleveland Innes and many more are actually professors of Athabasca University. Um, so that is the reputation part, the passion part, the vision part all together. Add to that the convenience. You work from, you know, at, uh, according to your own time. Most, as I mentioned, there are practitioners that are there, whether uh, they're leaders and, you know, program directors or teachers or at different levels, right? Nurses, practitioners, or even uh, programs of, of nursing and so many different fields with leadership and experience. But um, after work, 
they do their 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 doctor online. Um, so it's convenient in terms of time. It's convenient in terms of space. It's in your own uh, place and it's in your own country. If I have to say, if you have a job and you would like to do that, you don't really have to do the move to, to Canada itself, depending on your motive, of course. But um, you can do that. Family is a, one of the main also, um, you know, reasons for people to do that. Like me, I have a toddler that I take care of. And that was also part of the equation of, you know, declining the UT and, and getting into this program. And people have jobs um, to put bread on the table and at the same time pursue their dreams and finish up, you know, their, their degrees that I wanted to do. So how, how is this program designed? This is um, one of the things that makes it unique as well is that it's a cohort based program. What does that mean? It means that unlike other universities, our program follows a con constructivist approach to learning, uh, not the transmission of learning, not packages or a password given to you uh, where you find a whole bunch of, you know, material that you have to go through and you, er you learn at your own pace and space, etc. cetera. But um, it's actually, you have a virtual class. You have a, uh, uh, you have classmates that are moving from day one forward with you and doing different things together uh, online. And um, it is for that reason, it is more engaging and it's more collaborative and it has a requirement of synchronous uh, classrooms twice a week that uh, when everybody has to be online and we have like a classroom, but we're virtual there, we're the professor and with uh, everybody online at the same time, uh, synchroni synchronously like we're doing right now. And of course it has a lot of asynchronous work. Um, discussion boards is very, very uh, valued and that is really many people do not see the value of the asynchronous discussion board. But in terms of deep learning, research has shown that that is mainly where learning, uh, especially for adult learning, happens. Um, and it's a four-year program, as I mentioned, and then you're expected to write a proposal. And this is what that's the stage I am right now. Um, and also you're writing, you're supposed to, to write a dissertation. Our dissertation is different from packages because it's the traditional way of writing dissertations though. So personally, as I mentioned, I was, I'm residing in GTA and you might think, okay, I'm doing this little space. This is my space, right? This is my working space. Um, you might think that I do feel lonely as everything is done online in this particular corner. There's no one in person or no interaction, right? But well, let me tell you that, um, as I mentioned, I had my Fulbright experience, uh, my bachelor in Tunisia, my Fulbright experience in the US, my uh, master's experience um, in the United States where I was doing the research assistant, the teaching assistant, and being a student on campus, very active, yes. But um, this personal experience as an ED online student has been very rewarding. And, and it's just amazing how much it fosters foster the very strong sense of not only collegiality and classmates, but also bond with, uh, uh, with other students. Yes. So as I said, for me, I'm taking care of a toddler, which makes it like two in one. I value the time that I spend with, with my toddler and I value also my PhD or my EDD here, my doctoral studies. So doing both makes me feel psychologically very comfortable. I'm not doing something at the expense of my own family or a toddler. So I'm studying from home and really enjoying that, yet I'm very connected with my cohorts, as you can see in the picture. Those are many of my professors, my supervisors and cohort members. As you can see, the age <laughs> over there, um, people, the experience with, um, with uh, families with so many different uh, uh, commitments yet also still not given up and doing their doctoral studies and it's just a family has has become family for me. Um, 
so they are working, they're teaching, they come from different disciplines, uh, from nursing, from IT, from uh, linguistics, from applied linguistics, uh, also from education, general education um, uh, field, and, and more. And uh, language teaching K-12, uh, and uh, also higher education. And there are some of them are international students like we, we have students uh, from the United States, from Japan, from Nam Namibia, from Costa Rica, and the rest of us are all over Canada, like in Ontario, here I'm based in GTA, um, and others are from Manitoba, we have from BC, uh, we have from Saskatchewan, so it's a mix of uh, everything. So as I mentioned, there's a high level of engagement and the high level of bond and support, which is very uh, different from what people think. And, for, and I have to, to be honest, I didn't think it's gonna be this way at the beginning either. Um, so, however, there are a few challenges. The main challenge for online learning, um, it is done for adults, right? Mainly if you go back to the 20 years of um, history of online education. It's mainly for adults like us here, working, taking care of things and doing commitments, uh, having other commitments, but that requires a lot of self-regulation. After a long day of work or after a long day of other commitments, you need to have the time, uh, have the proper scheduling, have the uh, determination have that passion, have that long breath of continuation and being there to do your work. Um, and also the other challenge sometimes is the time zones for group work you need to consider, uh, you know, across or outside Canada, because even within uh, Canada, we have uh, one to three uh, hours of, of uh, time difference. Okay, so now the research experience so for me as i mentioned i come from an applied linguistics background and i've done a lot of uh, language teaching and i've done also um, uh, applied linguistics uh, undergraduate thesis uh, supervision i was a supervisor for undergraduate students so uh, um, for different um, studies related to whether through radical linguistics or applied linguistics um, uh, and the graduate, uh, not thesis memoirs, what we call them. And the also the 17 plus year of teaching experience, whether Arabic as a foreign language or English as a second language or in the United States or English as a foreign language uh, elsewhere in Tunisia and in Qatar. Um, I've had this passion towards building you know, second language acquisition and, 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 uh, and uh, language teaching. So basically bridge and theory and practice and the vision to bring this into the online uh, mode. And that's why both of my supervisors are uh, applied linguists. Um, and so for me, the focus is, is on L2 teaching and acquisition in an online multimodal environment in Canada, particularly my participants will be instructors, teaching online experts in Canada. Um, multimodality meaning that uh, that you have everything in the same place, all the package of your design and uh, access to it. And at the same time, you have the this audio video mode and uh, the synchronous audio chat uh, conversations and the ace, the delayed synchronous chat that we have. So not other things. That's my main thing. Instruction and and language acquisition and pedagogy that reach, you know, pedagogy that would uh, would uh, uh, help students mediate and reach uh, language, language acquisition online. So we do have a proposal to write. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, once I pass that, hopefully in a, in a month, I will be officially a candidate for right now. I'm a third year student. Um, and then we have a doctoral dissertation to write, and my focus for, for that dissertation will be the ESL online experts um, and their experiences and their perspectives on language and second language acquisition uh, as well to inform about pedagogy and theory in an online multimodal environment. Um, 
So teaching experience at the ed level, and uh, well, we have uh, within our courses, there's one of the things that we need to do is to have an internship. So this internship, you can do, um, you can teach a course online with our, again, our constructivist approach to learning, not the traditional way, um, to undergraduate or master's students. And um, so you be teaching for, for the undergraduate or the, on your own or from the master's co-teaching with somebody else, uh, another main instructor. Um, and then you learn how to facilitate online. So we talk more about facilitation online, not really teaching actually. And there's also the other part, which is the MOOCs, the massive open um, online courses. Um, our university is also leading in um, research MOOCs because they have, our professors are the one who design and work uh, with uh, closely with uh, the Commonwealth. Um, they have grants and they have massive, uh, um, they have MOOCs that are, we call the, the iMOOC, the iMOOC, which is the constructivist, uh, also adopting the constructivist approach, very unique. Requires a lot of money to be done, but it's very unique as experience and it's for free. So if you look up, you have so many access uh, to, to access to so many uh, of those MOOCs. I particularly signed up for the MOOCs, not for the co-teaching of other courses, because again, it's a new thing and I wanted to explore uh, new things and exciting <laughs> journeys as, as well. And it, also I was involved in research. So it's some, um, and research in terms of identifying what kind of facilitation does it really happen when we talk about MOOCs where about 10,000 students sometimes attend in the same course, right? So it's a very exciting journey in terms of um, teaching and in terms of also doing research. And there are also graduate teaching assistantships available and also graduate research assistantship available through the university and external um, venues. Yeah. So as I mentioned, people have different motives to do things, including pursue, pursuing doctoral studies. Uh, for me personally, it has been the main goal since I left Tunisia 17 years ago <laughs> to do this, you know, after having a bachelor's, my goal is getting a doctoral uh, degree. Um, and I've gone through all those, you know, the research leadership and, and teaching experiences that I've had, but, um, I'm, a, I'm still, I am a lifelong learner. My nieces and my nephews always tell me, oh, are you still studying? And I'm like, yes, it's not going to end even after this doctoral study program. Um, yeah, so I am a lifelong learner and it means a lot to me to keep learning. Uh, why online? Again, because it suits my schedule and mainly because I uh, and my family and because I had a vision and realized the future of language learning and teaching and education in general, more and more moving and valuing to the online mode. So I'm going to stop right here. And before I move to your questions, I'll, I'll throw a question for you to think about and reflect. What is your motive? And what is your vision? Why do you want to do uh, a doctor, a PhD or an EDD? Thank you. OK, thank you so much, Shadia. And yeah, thank you, Pakize, for the uh, wonderful presentations. Yeah, I, I didn't know that there is an online um, opportunity to do the doctoral degree, which is which is awesome. I think, yeah, in that sense, I guess, yeah, Canada is the leader, right? I think I haven't it heard is. it in anywhere else. It is indeed. It is Canada is the leading in distance education and online mm -hmm. learning. Um, um, opportunity to do, yeah, that. right. Yeah. Yes, right. um, so you. there are so many questions. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll se select them so that right. I can voice, you know, so the, sure. I will, um, combine two or three so that it's easier, right, for us to handle. Yeah, um, so many people asked about the yeah, IELTS, uh, whether, yeah, again, so the proficiency, like um, for, to Antabasca University, do they need to 
provide some of proficiency the, tests? There are language proficiency requirements. Mm -hmm. um, for those who earn the master's from a, an English speaking university, like uh, the United States or the UK or Australia, mm -hmm. then you don't have to provide IELTS. But if you don't, then I believe you do IELTS or proof of other language proficiencies. I don't remember the details exactly because I was exempt because I had I earned my master's from um, mm -hmm. the United States. So mm -hmm. I didn't have to provide other proof other than my master's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it might, yeah, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. um, right, yeah, you can check the website, right? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, I said with some... Yeah, I believe any university, for especially for 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 a PhD or an EDD, language proficiency, since it's done in English, that is a must right. in a way or another. Maybe that the the bend is different, right? The requirement, mm -hmm. but I do believe it's a must to provide language right. proficiency because you're going to be writing a lot. I mean, we yeah. I don't know how many papers did we write back as a software and how many thousands and yeah. thousands of words. It's all about reading and writing yeah. in English. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think I think it's the same requirement at Concordia University. I did not need to provide any proof of language proficiency, although English is my second language, um, because I got my master's from from TESO in English the United speaking. States. Yeah. But I just mm -hmm. shared a link to uh, to the admissions page of Concordia University if you're interested in seeing um, the the band scores required. I think for IELTS it's six six point five. It's not too high. Mm -hmm. um, but usually, well, there, there is an EAP program, ESL program at Concordia University where you could go ahead and, and improve your English skills. But I think for PhD students, it's not something, it's not an option. So you right. need to prove that you're proficient in English. And, mm -hmm. and then Pak is also to add to that, remember the, 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 um, uh, the application itself, like at Athabasca University and also, you know, Concordia University. They are very competitive universities, right? And um, that's why I said, what's your motive? What's your selection, <laughs> right? It really depends. There are so many other universities that you can select from, but uh, what it comes to mind at least, and I'm sure the same with PAC is uh, there is competition. You're asked to write a statement of interest. You are um, also asked to write um, a same for PAC is a, a research statement or research proposal, different formats, right? Um, we also had an interview. So after passing all that pre-selection, you go through another selection of interviews uh, to be admitted or not. And you need to have in mind uh, supervisors that would uh, match um, your uh, interests, especially for us in the, the EDD programs, because there are m more of, you know, general education, like for us, the online learning on teaching and online learning and research. So those um, uh, courses related to the field, but at the same time, we come from different fields. So you need to have somebody matching your field to be able to do your dissertation and research. So if you're talking about something different in your research statement or proposal, uh, or on the day of the interview and you're unable to, to say, well, this particular person matches my interests, then you're not putting yourself at an advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great, thank you. Is there age limit? No. No, no. <laughs> no, in Canada, yeah. no. No, no. <laughs> right. And yes. there is no, the other very piece, um, important piece of information, there is no GRE. <laughs> right, right. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the GRE right. in the United States. It's, in the oh, United oh, States. Oh, goodness. Yeah, know, that's a very annoying thing to, to get it through, is. right? It is. It is. There's no GRE requirements in Canada in general across all universities. That's uh, that's great. My uh, A few of my um, classmates or colleagues are 70 plus years old. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have also in the 20s. Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. so it's yeah you know, different ranges of right mm -hmm. yeah ranges. coming back to the IELTS requirement or in general English language proficiency requirement yeah if it is even if it says 6.5 I think um, that might be enough for other um, areas right but I think in social studies in education so that's yep. not I think in, enough level right to absolutely I, to I totally agree. Your, 
And also for a PhD, uh, exactly. you know, you, 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 all you do is to write research. Right, and it is <laughs> academic, right? It's not, <laughs> it yeah, you write, you read and you... write academic, and it is, should be, I think, at least 7.5 um, in for, for reading and writing, right? At mm -hmm. least, right? So mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. And presenting as well. I mean, how many exactly. presentations do we have to do? Exactly. I mean, you write a paper right. and you present. It's both. So yeah, we're exactly. working on both the written right. piece and the, the, the oral discourse piece as well. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, yeah. So don't look at these kind of as a end point, right? As um, Shadia was saying, what's your motive, right? So like mm -hmm. getting like uh, admission is not the end result, right? It's just the beginning of the journey, right? So Absolutely. therefore... IELTS is or like is not a gatekeeper, right? It's just uh, um, something that will help you along, right? And therefore, sometimes I know that they even don't ask for um, language um, proficiency in some universities uh, because, yeah, the idea is that you should be already be able to read and write, and you know that you sh you should have the adequate level of English proficient, right? So like highly proficient, be highly proficient in English to be mm -hmm. able to do research in it. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, they, people asked about articles. Um, is there any requirement um, to complete your, to get your PhD degree? Um, are you expected to publish certain number of articles? Uh, not at Concordia University, but I know that some universities require that. Like before you graduate from your uh, PhD program, you need to publish, you know, two articles in a high tier journal kind of requirement, which is, <laughs> which is scary, I guess. But uh, for, for us, no, there's no such a requirement. It's just like, it depends on you. If you want to publish and, you know, get a good CV, then, then go ahead and published studies working, um, you know, that's something happens when you're working as a research assistant, mm -hmm. you are involved in a lot of research anyways, and then, you know, you're part of the publication experience, but at Concordia Universities, we don't have that. We don't have that either in, in our online doctoral program. Um, we did have a research as a cohort and it was published recently, but um, it's us that we wanted to do that. It was not a requirement. And it's not even related, we, um, you know, to, to the dissertations that we were, we're having. It's a different dissertation, right? It's just a cohort um, research that we've done together. So, yeah, it really depends on the program. But generally speaking, no, but mm -hmm. some, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. So, and there was one specific question to Pakizu, how um, you got interested in writing? Um, I, I, well, that, kind of, that is related to my teaching experience, actually, mm -hmm. like, you know, I wanted to build on that experience uh, during my PhD. I, mm -hmm. I honestly, like I'm studying uh, assessment uh, of integrated writing, but I've never been a good test taker myself. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I was, <laughs> I was researching a lot about, you know, testing anxi anxiety, like how you deal with the washback. Um, mm -hmm. I am an anxious person and what can you do about it, right? Like, and. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about IELTS I was just reflecting on on the same thing you know sometimes like you your your language skills are actually pretty good you are a good communicator but when it comes to a test it is uh it is a different scenario but mm -hmm. I would say um you know I always had a passion for PhD and when it comes to like what am I going to focus on it is based on my experience because you know you feel secure to study something that you already know about you have some, uh, you already have an interest uh, in right. that. So I yeah. didn't want to study something that would put me in a position where, you know, I have to experience first and then go back and, uh, and do research about it. So I right. built a lot of my experience on, on my teaching. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's a good question because, you know, many some kind of people come up to me as well and many others, you know, saying, oh, like, I don't know how to choose my PhD topic, you know. So that's kind of the common question I think many people struggle, I think, and it's a good answer, right? So first of all, you have to look at what you are really interested in, right? Maybe something that you do very well or something you don't do very well, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Case, something that's... that you struggle, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, um, something that you kind of um, first have 
that personal experience with that, right? So what about you, Shadia, um, well, in your case? Partially, yes, because for me, um, I am doing online learning and at the same, which is completely new. It's a different field in itself. But at the same time, I brought in my applied linguistics baggage with me into that new uh, field. Otherwise, I wouldn't be comfortable. I wouldn't have been comfortable, you know, um, throwing myself into that program without making sure that, oh, there are applied linguists within the, fa the, the, the faculty members, then there we go. My research will be uh, related to applied linguistics and, you know, language uh, pedagogy, um, mediating language acquisition. But right now, moving from the face-to-face -face with actually face, this is actually face-to-face, -face, right? So from the in-person, <laughs> from the in-person to the online mode. So I did, I took the middle, right? I was in the middle. Yes, I wanted something exciting and new and the, the long-term future of education, but at the same time, well, I'm comfortable doing this and I have experience mm -hmm. and I have research and this, so I'm building up into that, taking it to the other level. Right, yes. Yes, yes. and you did the right choice, right? So with these pandemics, everyone shifted to the <laughs> that, exactly right. overnight, I mean, I... <laughs> right? So everyone had to shift. That. Yeah, that's why I'm like, it's... <laughs> it's not it's something new, it's just new normal, right? Became a new normal for everyone. But it's, it's good to be pragmatic. It's, ha it's good to have a passion, but it's, at the mm -hmm. same time, it's good to be pragmatic. I had mm -hmm. to study really well. Some people tell me, oh, University of Toronto. Absolutely. It's a very valuable program, right? And it's it's the top university in the United right. States and, and Canada. I'm still, my mind's still within the U.S., right? I'm a lot of years in the U.S., only okay. three years in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I mean, it's the vision. Um, I didn't know it's going to happen. The pandemic's going to happen. Of course, nobody knew, right? But I did, you do study, you know, you do study the field as in the academia and at the same time, the job market, what's going on. Where, where's, where's, what's the new trend? Where, where are we go heading towards, right, right now? And then you kind of make choices according to your background, according to your abilities, according to your um, commitments, according to your own um, life, and um, make decisions. So it's, it's not an easy decision to make, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you Sorry, so I much. Have a so I just wanted. Yet. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I, sorry. Um, uh, my uh, research topic is connected with um, developing writing and the speaking skills of building. Can you uh, suggest any um, methods for developing these uh, uh, skills of um, bilingual students? Some helpful, um, maybe useful methods which I can um, try with my students. Um, have you heard a question? Because I, I couldn't hear it it's, well. I think if you turn oh. off your camera and then speak, we would uh, have a better uh, sound quality. We couldn't hear you. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah. Is it okay now? Type your question. Uh, type mm -hmm. questions. Okay. Yes, um, then it would be easier okay. to read it mm -hmm. out. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to um, take the time to introduce um, Oluk Bek. Oluk Bek, are you here? Yes. Yes, uh, I'm who here. Who was a liaison uh, for <laughs> us. Uh, um, Hello, so guys. Assalamu alaikum. Sorry, guys, to you know to be late. Assalamu alaikum, Pakiza. Assalamu alaikum, Chadia. Assalamu alaikum, colleagues who are following us um, in, in Uzbekistan and other places. Um, Chadia and Pakiza, thank you so much for allocating time to give this webinar to... Um, you know, English language teachers in, in Uzbekistan. Um, I greatly appreciate it. I'm, my apologies that um, uh, I was a little bit late because, you know, I thought it would start at um, 8 o'clock in Tashkent time, you know. No, uh, 7 o'clock in Tashkent time because we had a webinar yesterday. And, you know, I'm in Chicago right now. And, you know, then apparently, you know, it started at 8 o'clock. You guys are in Canada, right? So, and, you know, we are all in different parts of the world. So um, thank you so much for the great talk, Pakiza. Long time no see. You know? I know, I know. It's great catching up with you. Now, thanks for the opportunity. I, I'm, I'm happy if, we, if, if, if we, Shadi and I are, we are both happy that if, 
you know, if you could answer some of the questions that the community has. So it's, it's lovely. Yeah, thank you. And also special thanks to Nodrop actually who arranged everything because, yeah. you know, we were just thinking about it. You know, people who are actually watching this webinar, right? Nodrop about like, what, three months ago were like, yeah. you know, like, you know, we should also bring some Canadian perspectives, you know. Who is in Canada? You know, Chadia, I didn't know that you were in Canada. I was like, oh, Pakistan is in Canada, you know. No, I didn't say Pakistan is in Canada. I said Pakistan is in Canada, eh? You know, hey, yeah. <laughs> Canadian way. Hey. And I said, maybe, and I said something like, maybe Pakis and Chadia can give a webinar about, you know, pursuing doctor <laughs> Yes. <laughs> from, anyway, so from house. <laughs> exactly. So thank you so much, guys. I don't have a question. Yeah. I just want to say you. thank you. You know, mm -hmm. because as doctoral students, you guys must be super swamped. You know. Um, in, in the U.S. right now, people are busy cooking their turkey because of the Thanksgiving, but I'm sure like you guys are busy, you know, writing up your papers and getting ready for the presentation. Anyway, I really greatly appreciate um, your contribution. And as we say, Allah Razi Wasan, you know, Jazakallah Hayr. And thank you so much again. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we shared our emails in the chat box. So please uh, feel free to email us um, if anything or have more questions. We'd be happy to communicate with you. Okay, thank you so much. So there are very specific questions and I'm mm -hmm. not sure whether they are not related to research, I guess. So there may be teaching methods. Um, just one of them is just saying uh, how to teach writing and uh, speaking. Um, yeah, if you have any kind of suggestions. Um, another one is about corpus linguistics, um, how to develop the corporate corpora of Uzbek language. Well, that's something we always talk about with Ulugbek, right? Ulugbek, Uzbek corpus. <laughs> uh, that's one of the things um, that should be done. But mm, I'm not sure how you can handle this question because they are too broad, I guess, right? So, that would require another webinar. I know, <laughs> right? But not, yeah, not only even one webinar, right? So just, each one of them, <laughs> each one with one yes. with the webinar. <laughs> At least, right? At least mm -hmm. one, right? So, yes. yes. Um, yeah, but if you want to say some kind of on top of top of your head, if you want to say something. Um, well, I can, I've done some, some studies uh, concerning like using corpus corpus methods, but I, I've never tried to compile my own on corpora. So that's, uh, that's something quite interesting. And I, I am originally from Turkey and I like in, in Turkish also, we don't have a, you know, comprehensive collection of, uh, of different types of uh, registers and genres. Uh, so that is something really interesting, but I, I guess it takes a lot of like collaborative work um, and also a um, collection of all different sorts of, um, you know, you know, sort while well, speaking text. and, and text. writing, writing <laughs> yeah. text from, from different time periods. So that is something that takes a long time and long effort and and contribution from other people. That's all what I know about corpus compilation. But I, uh, I created an EAP corpus using uh, my supervisor's collection of students' work. And that's something you can easily create on your own. You just have to turn, uh, turn those like uh, written text into text files and, and use, uh, use a corpus analyzer to look into certain features. So that's something easy and manageable. But when it comes to just like building an Uzbek language corpus, that's beyond uh, my knowledge and yeah. experience that would be a doctoral studies um yeah. dissertation in itself um yeah. and the postdoc because uh, continuation yeah. exactly have, uh, so the it end product team, right <laughs> yes of course yes. it should be team effort and it is large scale yeah mm -hmm. um there are some attempt i think um attempts um about this big language as well so yeah of course yeah it's not, maybe not comprehensive but there are some um small scale um projects been done and yeah uh yeah thank you so yeah about teaching writing but and listening teaching, and writing teaching writing and speaking i'll talk about the online uh, mm -hmm. modes in here i mean um multimodality um meaning having the this synchronous uh, mode and the asynchronous uh modes allow for many different ways of uh, collaborative and constructivist uh, approach to learning, uh, whether for the writing uh, skill 
uh, where students could uh, virtually collaborate in a piece of uh, writing, where uh, they can work on a project, they can use the uh, interactive board um, uh, to uh, write in groups, uh, or they can turn a, a speaking uh, project into writing, or the other way around, a writing uh, project into a speaking, creating uh, short videos and upload it online. There are so many different ways that this multimodality in particular allows for speaking and writing in the online mode, <laughs> basically. Yeah. 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 Um, more um, than in the classroom, actually, <laughs> because right. you have access to many different exactly. resources as well yeah. that mm -hmm. you can build in. But uh, the key is the design. So your teaching starts before uh, meeting students or being with them or not being with them. It starts preparing uh, and designing for your own courses to allow them to do the work they need to, to, to be done. Yeah, because much depends on who your students are, right? So what are their needs, right? Their level, why they need to develop their writing, right? What exactly they need <laughs> to write, right? right? In the long run. Yeah, there, um, there's so many things. In, in Canada though, I have to, to, to mention this, um, they have the Canadian language benchmark, which is different from the European uh, framework and, and other others, uh, you know, in part of the world, uh, which is mainly task-based, right? Their approach to teaching ESL is uh, very much uh, task-based oriented because it depends on the large, massive number of immigrants uh, coming to Canada uh, to, learn, uh, to learn ESL. So it will be um, a, a, a very interesting and, and a different approach to teaching languages. Um, uh, elsewhere yeah absolutely and you know that in Nadra more right because oh yes, you know, yes yes absolutely yes um, <laughs> um absolutely teaching right so like um we teach students who live in an english-speaking country right so mm -hmm. we are kind of yet yeah, preparing them to settle better in canada mm -hmm. right so they don't have other students in other parts of the world they don't have that aim right so and the yep. tasks writing tasks that we develop are not may not be relevant to the needs of other students right so yeah therefore it's difficult to <laughs> suggest anything right so recommend anything um, in particular Great. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, yeah, I, it was um, such an honor to have you and I myself learned a lot <laughs> today. It was the first time I learned about online university. And yeah, of course, it's always um, I love Montreal. It's such a beautiful city. Um, yeah, it was um, so nice to hear your experiences. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Keep in touch. I hope we'll keep in touch. Yes. Um, yeah. It's it's our pleasure. Thank you so much, Nadira, and thank you everyone for uh, for joining us tonight. And uh, we we just um, put our email addresses in the chat box. Please feel free to email us if you have any questions that we could help you with. So we'll be happy to to do so. Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hoping to catch thank up. You. With you. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, so everybody. Much. Thanks. Yes. Have a good you day. Have a good day. Good night. Good afternoon, Bye. whatever. <laughs>